today I'm here to share with you uh, research projects that our team has been conducting around conflict in healthcare. It's great to see some familiar faces here in the audience. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge our team. So our team consisted of a uh, physician and uh, especially business school colleague, Ryan Fair, um, who has his uh, expertise in organizational psychology and our nursing colleagues. So the way I organize uh, today's talk is to think together with you the types and impacts of workplace conflict and to bring that to our context in healthcare. And then to share with you the key findings from our research projects. Uh, and also I brought a little bit of teaching portion that we, we used in our research. Uh, it's a model for how to engage in difficult conversation with colleagues. So before I begin, I would like to invite you to reflect on your most recent conflict you had with another colleague as part of your day-to-day -day patient care work or maybe in your personal life. So think about that conflict and think about, well, first of all, who was involved in that conflict? What triggered it? And if it remains unresolved, What's the barrier to resolution? Can we take a, and if you can all hold that question, um, we'll come back to that. And I'd like to start by setting some context. So workplace conflict. I think you as healthcare professionals will agree with the statement. When a conflict remains unrecognized, unaddressed, and unresolved, it can actually create an impact on individual providers' morale, your well-being, your team's cohesion, and the organizational culture. And ultimately, it can harm patients. So when we think about conflict, I urge you to think about conflict using these categories. Normally, we say, oh, I have a lot of conflict at work. But in the organizational business literature, they think about conflict in two categories. One is more task-based. One is more relationship-based. So when you have disagreements with colleagues over policies, protocols, hospital standards, guidelines, that can be reconciled with just-in-time clarifications or explanations, then, that, then we tend to think of that as task. But the majority of our conflicts happen due to relationship-based conflicts. So usually these are personality differences or differences in our cherished norms and values. I cherish deadlines. So for example, if a colleague uh, doesn't meet the deadline around manuscript or grant proposal, that's my hot button. Where does my mind go? Oh, so irresponsible doesn't care. I personalize things. The truth is, in real life, in our messy world, the conflicts don't neatly stay within the task category or the relationship category. Something happens. So what started out as a routine collegial conversation with somebody ends up in your colleague storming out of your office. And you sit in that hushed, silence and you wonder, I don't know what happened. Has that happened to anyone? So I'm interested in hearing from you what escalates a routine, manageable task conflict into out of control relationship conflict. Anyone? If you can just, there is no right, wrong answer. Everything is juicy answers here. Yes, our, so the perception that we're not being heard. Ego. Ego gets involved. History. Prior history. What if you had unresolved interactions with this person and that prior history cast this long, ugly shadow into the present moment? So when conflict detonates, usually it's our ego, our feelings, our identity 
are involved. And, that's, and this is happening so rapidly. It's very hard to pause, manage it, and re-engage. But we believe training can help. So let's look at some data from the business world. So when the researchers went out to the US co companies, this is outside of healthcare, and they surveyed these employees and they found out that an, on average, a US employee spends about 2.8 hours a week dealing with workplace conflict, which amounts to approximately $360 billion in lost productivity. How many of you here spend more than three hours per week on conflict. <laughs> so for those offsite, I've, I'm happy to report the majority of them raise their hands. Uh, the, the higher you go up in the organizational structure, this number is gonna go up because it's part of your job to maintain a collegial work environment. They also asked these employees, uh, did you become ill or did you just skip work because of workplace conflict? And one out of four individuals say, yeah, I became ill or I just, I couldn't go because I couldn't face my manager. 10% of these surveyed employees said, our projects failed because we couldn't get along. What about in healthcare? So I'm gonna share with you two large scale studies one involves a survey of 3,600 US residents, and the, the researchers asked the residents two questions. How many types, how many sources of conflict do you have with either a physician, a nurse, or other allied health providers? And it's, at the same time, they asked them, have you ever been involved in medical errors or adverse events, or have you been named on malpractice claims? And I think the data speak for themselves. So the higher the number of sources residents reported in terms of the conflict they experienced with one of those three provider groups, the more likely they were to report that, yeah, I was involved in significant medical error or adverse event or named uh, on malpractice claims. Another large scale study involved 4,500 uh, physicians and nurses in the US and the researchers asked the providers, what's the impact of disruptive behaviors on your stress level, on your ability to concentrate, on your collaborative strength, and also has it impaired you in the form of burnout or other forms of impairment? And I think you can see the majority of them um, agreed with the statement that these disruptive behaviors uh, created negative impact on them. So what are disruptive behaviors? So let's turn to the Joint Commission. They published in 2008 the Sentinel event called uh, behaviors that undermine a culture of safety. And I'm, I will just go ahead and present these. So these disruptive behaviors constitute anywhere from overt behavior. So these are people shouting at each other. This involves physical threats or more of the covert passive aggressive behavior Colleagues saying, you know, it's not my job, you do it. Therefore, they're exhibiting uncooperative behavior. And the Joint Commission calls out intimidating leadership behaviors that include refusal to answer either phone calls, in-person questions, or pages, showing impatience when somebody's talking, rolling your eyes, letting out a long sigh, I mean, these are some of the uh, verbal behaviors associated with the impatience or using condescending language. You know, I'm surprised you have progressed this far. Shouldn't you, shouldn't you know this by now? So the Joint Commission report concludes that individual care providers who exhibit characteristics such as self-centeredness, Immaturity or defensiveness can be more prone to unprofessional behavior. They can lack interpersonal coping or conflict management skills.
I would like to highlight two additional behaviors at workplaces that we hear from colleagues. So workplace bullying is one disruptive behavior that we hear that happens, unfortunately, at workplaces. And I'm going to define this in a minute. The next one is, has anyone seen this painting by Norman Rockville? It's, you don't have to guess, because the title is The Gossips. So if you look at the top left-hand side corner, that's where the gossip ignited. And then it travels through multiple pairs of these gossip transmissions. And then at the end, the person who initiated the gossip is getting yelled at on the lower right-hand side. So relating to workplace bullying and gossip, uh, the American Nurses Association uh, published this statement, position uh, pa paper July this year, titled Incivility, Bullying, and Workplace Violence. So they define incivility as a form of rude and discourteous actions of gossiping, spreading rumors, and of refusing to assist a coworker. And bullying is repeated, unwanted, harmful actions intended to humiliate, offend, and cause distress in the recipient. And they call out all of these actions are an affront to the dignity of a coworker, and they violate professional standards of respect. So what's helpful is these national organizations, they tell us. These are the disruptive behaviors. But where are they coming from? They're informed by, in the trench, in the workplace, accounts and experiences and distresses of healthcare providers, including perhaps many of you here. So I'm going to transition to research studies that we conducted and completed uh, in the past two years. We were very fortunate to successfully compete for the Youth of Medicine uh, grant called Patient Safety Innovations Program in 2013. We were awarded uh, 50,000 uh, to study the kinds of conflict that take place at Youth of Medicine and use that knowledge to develop a training program and pilot it and show data. So the first phase of our study was uh, to examine the sources of consequences of conflict across youth of medicine. So this study was conducted across Northwest uh, Hospital and Harborview and youth of medical center. And remember the very first activity we did together, thinking about your most recent conflict, who was involved, what triggered it, what's the uh, outcome of that conflict, that was our interview lead-in question to 93 individuals who responded to our study. So these 93 individuals, um, they were categorized as uh, physicians or nurse practitioners, nurses and allied health prov providers, including techs. Uh, we were fortunate to recruit 13 youth of medicine leaders, so the chief medical officers, chief nursing officers, risk managers, patient safety officers. And also, as you know, the youth of medical center has a patient and family advisory council. So the membership comes from former patients or family members of former patients who receive care in our system. And now they're volunteering on one of several uh, QI initiatives. So we partnered with the council and recruited eight patients. With the patients, the questions were slightly revised. So the question was, while receiving care at University of Washington, did you witness any overt conflict that took place between the providers? How did that make you feel? That's what we asked. These uh, individuals gave us 156 unique conflict stories. So on average, um, each person gave us about two um, stories. And it took us about a year. If you had done qualitative research, it just takes uh, 
multiple iterative processes to identify the themes that emerge from these stories across different uh, categories of participants. So before I go into the sources, I just wanted to share with you uh, the, the consequences of these conflict, which shouldn't surprise you, each story had a, had a consequence either at the patient level or at the provider level. So we can place every story as either a patient safety satisfaction risk or at the employee's level that's impacting employee's career, their relationship on the team, their satisfaction and morale in this organization, their performance, and turnover. So we had individuals uh, who reported uh, leaving the institution um, uh, that they had witnessed in other colleagues. So I'd like to spend a little bit more time with you around the key sources of conflict that we found. So what we did in our research was we identified the themes across these 156 stories. We turned over these themes to our colleague in the business school, and we asked him, how do these themes appear in your literature, in the business and organizational psychology literature? So Dr. Fair helped us coin these um, themes. And every theme will point to some literature source and evidence. So we're going to spend time on the top five sources. I would like to um, discuss these five uh, peripheral sources, so breaking group norms. So for example, we heard stories from Harborview colleagues who say, you know, we have a mission towards the underserved. But I see some colleagues who turn away patients. Or they may say, you know, I don't want to waste medical resources on these types of patients. And they can ignite a conflict uh, between the providers. Resource depletion was a very interesting theme. This happens at the organizational level. Staff shortage, you don't have enough facilities, or equipment shortage. Especially we heard from night shift colleagues that, that they're working in resource uh, depleted environment. That's when it gets bone on bone. But at the individual level, we are also resource depleted. We're fatigued. We're burned out. We're going through distress at home. We're going through divorce. My child is sick. They come in to our workspace in the moment of conflict. Perceived competence and integrity, which is interesting, in the moment of conflict, we have individuals who say, you know what? Maybe I'm not good enough. So it's self-imposed um, perception. But also, this is the judgmental lens we place on our conflict. Why aren't you good enough? Shouldn't you know this by now? And Dr. Cherry already brought up the prior relationship. So we heard a lot of stories where uh, the prior interactions didn't reach some kind of reconciliation or resolution. So then the next encounter, it's just a setup. The, the unresolved prior interaction, it's just a setup for the next one, next one. It just, it's, a, it's this downward um, spiral. Any questions around these five themes? Do they resonate with you at any level? I see some head nods. So let's look at the five main sources. So failure to communicate. Um, let's begin there. So this is not about people mishearing words. Uh, this is about unclear role uh, setting or expectations. People not having matched um, understanding about the situations not receiving timely feedback, or feedback not provided in a constructive manner, or information transmitted, it's not complete. Literally, communication breakdown. And this happens every day. So some of the quotes by a physician. I got into, into this I'm right, you're wrong situation with a nurse over what medication to administer to a patient. I felt the nurse was hounding me, and I felt disrespected. Now that I'm more experienced, I try to listen to nurses, explain what I'm doing, and ask for their input. I also try to use the phone to connect with them in person. 
So this was a resident who just kept having conflict with the nurse. And one day, he just came to this realization, I should just explain to her why I need that information instead of giving a hard order. Another quote by a hospital leader, an OR team member was not part of a pre-planning meeting prior to the case uh, and the team communication about this case. During the case, this team member was unsure of his role and felt there was a general lack of respect towards him. He felt marginalized. When the patient oxygen desaturated, there was finger pointing and blaming of, towards him and the conflict quickly escalated. All it might have helped would have been the pre-case huddle and briefing and clarifying what individual team member's role was. But in the moment of patient deceleration, then there's this finger pointing and blaming. In terms of difficulties with navigating complex organizational structures, um, because our organization is specialized according to tasks, hierarchy, uh, goals and procedures and resources, this causes conflict. And I bet you, day to day, you live in this complex landscape. So one example, it's difficult to manage care when multiple teams are involved. There are multiple paging to the system, then waiting and waiting for the paging to be returned. Simply challenging to try to organize a conversation between the services in terms of what should be done for the patient. As a result, inappropriate information gets transmitted from poor documentation and lack of communication. Is this your world in any shape or form? This theme, focus on self over others, uh, is one of my all-time favorite because I carry this syndrome. This is about my perception that the other person is acting out of his or her selfish motives. It's always about you, isn't it? So here's an example. Conflict arises when a surgical service jumps the queue by insisting that its patient takes priority over other patients. The rationale for trumping the case is not always grounded in the high acuity nature of the patient. It is perceived that this card is used over and over again by certain medical teams, and at some point, it feels manipulative. Another example given to me by a resident. So there is a resident who cherishes his work-life balance. Duty hour comes, he's out the door, out of the hospital. So there is general perception in the group that the resident does not follow the unspoken protocol around handoff. One day, the other resident, who was the interviewee, got a page from a medical student, 30 a medical student, who said, Dr. So-and-so left, left me with all these workups. I don't know how to do them. So the first narrative that entered into this interviewee's mind was, oh, God, here we go again. It's all, all about him. It's inappropriate to leave these handoff uh, tasks to a medical student. Fortunately, this interviewee took time to prepare for and actually had a conversation with the resident. And it resulted in restored relationship. But think about it. I challenge myself almost every day. How many times am I walking away with this unverified um, perception about my colleague's behavior based on what I think is going on? It's all interpretation based. And until we ask the person and share our interpretation, then it'll remain as the absolute truth. And then worse, we may talk about it to others with others and then uh, distort their reputation. Dehumanization may be a strong word. I thought so initially. But dehumanization is an active concept uh, that's studied in business and organizational psychology. So this is when anyone's dignity or their humanity is denied, deprived. Any stories that hinted that, any stories around gossiping, any stories around bullying, they fit into dehumanization. An example from a patient. 
A new nurse was taking care of me. A nurse supervisor walked in and laid in to the nurse about what she was doing. This played out in front of my family. We were so uncomfortable by how the supervisor handled the situation in a disrespectful manner, the new nurse just looked horrified. Physician says the phone consultations can be abusive. When I call consultants, sometimes people can be short with me. The phone call depersonalizes the interaction. I prefer to communicate in person. When they see me in person, they're likely to interact with me more respectfully. So we heard a lot of um, uh, distresses around telephone consultations, even a seasoned attending. When uh, the seasoned attending was met with this, what was perceived to be a disrespectful encounter by a resident, that attending shared with me just the sheer distress that she uh, carried for uh, many, many months until she, she decided to go and talk to the attending of that um, specialty. Uh, and then eventually some feedback was uh, made to the resident. The last one, I say this to the last, we can spend days talking about power hierarchy in our environment. It will not surprise you that the power differential was one of the key sources of conflict trigger in our system. So the quotes, the a physician said, I disagreed with a senior attending over a patient care plan. The attending made accusatory remarks and refused to make eye contact with me for a week. I decided not to confront the senior person directly out of fear that the conflict may impact my academic career. The fear that I could be reprimanded by the senior attending lingers on. So we carry this burden of unresolved distress. And, uh, and we interact with that difficult figure uh, uh, with that, with that uh, unresolved uh, distress. A patient says, while discussing with a physician my course of treatment, another physician came in and didn't agree with the first phys physician's assessment and said to me, I think this may harm you. I felt the two physicians were in clear opposition with one another. I was caught in the middle of having to vote in favor of one provider over the other. So what was very interesting is people who perceive themselves as having lower power, such as residents and patients, that uh, phrase, I was caught in the middle, they blipped multiple times. So a resident may be asked by his or her attending to field a difficult telephone consultation with a senior attending of another specialty. They can't say no, they do it, but they, they're, they're caught in the middle. This also comes in uh, by the nurses. So the trauma team, the ER team, they're giving conflicting uh, orders to the nurse. The nurse says, I don't know who to listen to, and the patient care is not advanced. So our colleague in the business school said, what uniquely characterizes healthcare conflict apart from other industries this is the entrenched power. We live it, we breathe it, we're not even aware of it. And yet we have to negotiate it. And this is power structure within the medicine group, within nursing, between nursing and uh, physician group, between services, surgical services, with medicine services over patient transfer. We heard a lot of conflicts around palliative care decisions. So there are some of these hot zones of conflict that we identified at least based on these 156 stories. Before I transition, any questions for clarification or comment? I'm a little bit curious about how you're distinguishing healthcare from other industries. For instance, I mean, the military power is built in. In business, there's a really clear hierarchy, and sometimes it isn't, you know, the power structure is very clear. Yes. I feel like healthcare is much more similar to many other industries. I'm just trying to figure out why you're pulling out in terms of the power hierarchy, why you're trying to pull it out for healthcare versus others, just because it's implicit. Sure. 
Thank you. So the question is, is why is a power hierarchy unique in healthcare compared to military or business? It's unique because that power can be used or misused because of the moral imperity of having to save somebody. Now, I was in Reno for a conference this weekend. I actually grabbed a pilot who was waiting at McDonald's line, and I said, what do you do personally to encourage your team members to speak up? Because we're struggling with this. And he said before each flight, he gathers his team and he tells everybody, I count on you to tell me small or big matters. Tell me if you have concerns. And he repeats that with his co-pilot. Uh, now, aviation has greater stakes. If a plane goes down, the pilot goes down too. If a patient dies in the OR, the surgeon walks out. But still, there is something around in the name of patient care. We do great things, but also power can be misused. And in face of that power misuse, we hear from our colleagues very frequently, it's very difficult to speak up and advocate for our role for myself. We can come back to that. It's an important question, um, and I can share with you some additional work we're doing around power. I'd like to transition to the next phase of the, um, our research. So we learned, we learned some rich information about sources and consequences of conflict. Then our next charge was, okay, let's develop a training program and let's pilot it. So that led us to this uh, randomized control trial, which uh, completed last year. So we recruited 60 nurses and physicians across uh, UW Medicine. Uh, this also involved colleagues from Seattle Children's as well. And uh, 30 individuals were randomized into control group and 30 in the intervention group. All 60, upon enrollment, they completed a web-based survey. We wanted to know, in general, how they uh, deal with conflicts. We wanted to know whether they had received conflict management training in the past. Then there is a validated web-based survey called Thomas Kilman uh, Conflict Survey. I'm going to uh, come back to this. Everyone completed this, and then they received a customized report in terms of their tendency and their style in approaching conflict. Then what we did is for the intervention group, they went through a three-hour workshop. So six to eight individuals were offered to take one of four training that we offered at three different hospitals. And I'm going to share with you what that training looked like. So they complete the training. Control group didn't complete the training. But all 60 individuals, now they got emails from us. We, and I'll show you some sample emails. So what we wanted to do is simulate real life um, conflict. So we wanted individuals prior to their actual simulated encounter with a professional actor, prior to that we use email as kind of a precursor to this conflict dialogue they were going to have in person with the actor. I'll come back to that. And that s simulation with the trained actor, the, their performance uh, was uh, used as the outcome measure. And then there was a post-survey control group was offered to take the uh, training. So this Thomas Kilman conflict style, you can go online and pay uh, a little bit, and then you can take this, or there's paper version you can take as well. It will place you in one of five categories. Do you tend to avoid conflict, like the majority of our research participants? Avoiding means my concern for you and for, for, uh, for myself is pretty low. It's so low, I'm not going to have this conversation. It's off my radar chart. Accommodating means uh, my concern for you is greater than my concern for myself. You matter. 
I can take a back seat. That was the second uh, predominant style, collaborating, collaborating, compromising. These people are more transactional. Why don't you give up your shift? I'll give up your shift. They don't necessarily go into dialogue for identifying, exploring mutual goals. They're very pragmatic people. Competing, unfortunately, that's where I come out uh, when I took the survey. And uh, so this means my concern for myself exceeds my concern for you. But I, I stand here to, to, to show that training can help. <laughs> Although there is no post survey on myself yet, yes? I mean, this is, but did you randomize these? Yes. yes. Where, where was the randomization done? Where was the randomization? The randomization is the, the control or the intervention. Group. Was it done before they started this, or did it occur after? That's a great question. Surgery? Yeah, no, it, the randomization was done prior to their taking this um, uh, survey. Uh, so they, when they did the survey, did they know they were going to have this conflict workshop <coughs> before they did the survey or after they did the survey? You know, uh, that's a good question. I think they had the knowledge of their group uh, identification. That's a very good question. Well, you could change the whole thing. Although they didn't know what their conflict style was. We, we withheld the report until the completion of the study. So with the completion, they got $100 uh, incentive plus the uh, customized report. We had the data. We analyzed their performance by their conflict style, and we found no differences. So here's the email exchange. Again, the email was purely to create a little bit of that gut sense, uh, real life, like high fidelity conflict situation. So we had 14 members, two MDs, a nurse, myself. We manned 15 Gmail accounts. Because the university uh, had concerns about using uh, us using state resources. So we used <laughs> Gmail account. And so uh, we, took on, we took on a role, the opposite role of the research subject. So if the research subject is an MD, as shown in this slide, then I would have been the nurse. But the scripts were sim the same. We just um, changed the context. So um, the, our team member introduced uh, a conflict. In this case, uh, there was a patient complaint note. And we just created one. Uh, so this is a patient uh, complaining about the level of care. Uh, the patient received around pain management. And then what's not shown here is the bickering that happened between the nurse and the doctor at the bedside. And that just, and so the patient says, I'm not going to come back here again. We just send that to the person. And all four of us followed a standard script. And we just, so this is an MD subject responding back. Uh, Thank you for sharing the note. This is distressing. Could you share with me more details? So the next one our team sent was, all I know is this patient was in pain for a long time and wrote a complaint. If he got the medicine sooner, he wouldn't have been in pain. And then it continues two to three exchanges. At the end, we were scripted to say, we're not, we're not going to resolve this over email. Please come in. Let's meet. So that meeting was an in-person, one-hour meeting with a professional actor. So, and the purpose of that meeting was to continue the discussion that began in their email exchange. I'm happy to share that we had no single dropouts. You can imagine these are your colleagues who are extremely busy and stretched. All 60 individuals completed this uh, encounter at U of MC, Harborview, and Northwest. So the outcome measures we used, um, it was the, we videotaped these uh, events. So our three team members, we uh, evaluated the, the Gestalt level, the global rating. And then we had 11 checklist items, which matched the training components, which I'm going to share with you. So the differences, although they are statistically significant between the control and the intervention group, the gap is not as, um, as high as we would have liked to have seen. 
Uh, at the same time, in our manuscript that's going to the Joint Commission that we're declaring one of the limitations is because probably we had a very vested group of colleagues who were willing to go through this. So they probably brought some, um, uh, some good baseline uh, skills. So with that, I'd like to spend the rest of the time quickly, and I'd like to leave some room for Q&A, but it might be helpful for you to see the training that these 60, the 30 individuals went through. Uh, and we recently did uh, a little bit of training with one of your divisions in hematopathology division uh, at the request of Dr. Cherian. So uh, this training was offered on two different occasions. Uh, and it was, I, I benefited so much from the energy and the thoughtful comments that your colleagues and staff had. So this teaching model I'm sharing with you, it's, it's structured according to four steps, if you will. So we asked the participants, get ready for, for this conversation. How often do we just barge in and just detonate what the issue is? Preparation pays off. And we'll go into the details. Create the neutral space. Now do the work. Close and affirm. I'll go through this. We have tried this model with about 350 individuals throughout UW Medicine. We're doing this with UW Medical Center nurse, charge nurses next Monday. And um, uh, we have seen the tremendous uh, positive feedback from individuals who complete this. So, it's part of getting ready. One of the biggest issues people struggle with is, what do I do with my emotion? The hot potato, it's there. So we train people, okay, acknowledge what that hot potato emotional trigger is, but don't rehearse it. I love Rumi, the 13th century uh, Persian poet who says, raise your words, not your voice. So for example, I have to honor my authentic anger, but I can't let that hijack the dialogue. So I'm learning how to use choice words to convey my anger without uh, remaining disrespectful. It's possible, I've tried it. I even the competitive self has tried this. Check for your biases, prior interactions. Could you be colored by some of the judgment and bias you have about this person. Acknowledge it, let it take the back seat. Commitment, I think, is a deliberate act. No matter what, I am going to remain respectful in this space. Having a clear goal as to what do I want to get out of this? Am I going to bring up what happened six weeks ago? Or what is the purpose of this goal? If you can tease out, there's usually the immediate priority goal that you have to achieve. And then you may, you may get to the midterm, long term later, but there's usually a reason why you need to have this conversation. Focus on it. Consider the setting. Respect other people's privacy. Creating the space is hard, especially if I'm emotionally charged. I'm likely to go and say, Brad, we got a problem here. Is, that is not a neutral start. A neutral start would be, Brad, I know how busy you are. Is this still a good time for us to talk? And Brad just offered me a cup of coffee and a seat. So it's neutral start. And suggesting a mutual goal, I know we have some disagreements, but I think we are trying to do the same thing here for this patient or for this issue. Psychological safety, that goes both ways. It's my safety and my colleague's safety. If I see colleagues welling up in tears, I'm not going to bulldoze my talking points. I'll check in. Would you like a break? Is this still a good time? So we help individuals create that space. Doing the work is the heart of this dialogue. Uh, and it's usually in storytelling and story listening. So we elicit the other person's story first. It's like the elevator, let the other person get up first. I didn't know what active listening was until I had to be in this um, dialogue space. Active listening does not mean I'm loading up all of my beautiful, eloquent answers. It's truly to listen, but listening intently. 
I look for two things. One is, what's the new information I didn't know before? Second, okay, I'm hearing some confirmatory comments here. I don't have to bring it up. We both are worried about something. We don't have to talk. So there's an active reprioritizing of what I'm going to say to the individuals when I listen intently. Um, sharing my story, so it's hard to separate out our interpretations from facts because usually they are, they are beautifully blended in this shell of absolute truth. But we have to ground our story. So I'm going to just pick on my friend, Dr. Charon. Dr. Charon, in the committee meeting, when you cut me off, I could not finish my sentence. I'm sure it wasn't your intent not to let me finish my and share my ideas. Could you please help me understand what was going on with you? Dr. Charon may say, you know, I had multiple agenda items unresolved, unresolved from last time, and I just had to go through the meeting. There's usually a story there. Uh, and then I talked about using words uh, to express emotions. Closing and affirming, I always forget to do this, especially if the conversation didn't go well. So this is to negotiate on the next steps. And it's to say something affirming, even if the conversation didn't go well. So this might be, Brad, I know we didn't accomplish everything that we set out to do, but I hope you would agree that this was a good start. I value our professional relationship and look forward to our future connections. I try to say that, even if I had to hear some outrageous comments about me in this meeting, because it's about me trying to practice respectful um, practices. So, so that was a training model, but it took three hours to teach this in detail. And we had two professional actors and two scenarios, and everyone had a hot seat moment with a very skilled facilitator. And the rest of the audience members served as expert panels, so everyone participated. And that's the training that seems to be highly valued by our colleagues, at least the 350 that we have shared this with. And we're happy to uh, bring this to you uh, if you think this is um, valuable. So I just want to close. Uh, so we'll have some time for Q&A. And I would like to close with this quote by Rumi, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field, and I'll meet you there. And it's just a reminder as to how often I'm locked into this black and white space. I am right, you're wrong. I'm being fair, you are unfair. You're being unjust, I'm just. Then I'm not ready to hit that field. And, uh, but it's, it takes practice, it takes deep humility, at least on my part for myself, and I know this is hard. Uh, but I think with practice and commitment, we might be able to get to the field. So I thank you very much for the invitation and for your attention. And I'm happy to entertain any questions, any insight. So how much of the conflict that you mentioned early on was spawned by people with or email etiquette, you know, refusing to just meet in person, which seems to me like the most common sense thing to do. But lots of people don't do that. So, so the question is, how much? Could you reframe that again? Yeah, I mean, the question, the real question is, should your default be to just meet in person? Because email seems to mm. be a bad. So the question is, uh, should your default for repairing relationship or addressing conflict, should the default be in person? What do you think? What has worked for you? When do you use in person versus email or even telephone calls? Dr. Chu. Sarah, um, Big Blues in the unmaking of IBM discusses the conflict between T.J. Watson Jr. and Sr. And then they discuss the downfall of IBM when that constructive conflict at the upper echelons went away. 
So would you like to comment on that? I mean, I'm sure there must be a balance between having no conflict and some conflict. So before we go there, let's resolve this question first. Yes. I think you should always use not email. <laughs> <laughs> I think email is really problematic for most people. So the comment is the email can be problematic. Uh, it leaves for interpretations. People who are reading it in the heat of the moment, they're going to create more stories. Uh, so our goal is not to hatch more stories, is to rope in our stories around mutual goal. Um, I guess you'll have to discern what's the stake of the issue. How hot is your emotion? And what's your prior experience with that person? Can you leverage your prior relationship? And maybe email could work with some colleagues, I can imagine. But see, we, we, we're in an environment here where we are told that nothing exists unless it's in writing in the way of dealing with these conflicts. When we all know that the personal interaction which really solves it, but the hierarchy demands written evidence of this, and if it's not in writing, they ignore it. It doesn't matter how blatant it is, it's totally ignored unless it's in writing. So it forces a whole cultural change in how you would normally conduct personal interactions. So yeah, people start an email trail because it meets the requirements of you know, the groups that oversee these conflicts outside of us, but it's not a solution. And in fact, it's actually the wrong way to do it. Because we all know that until you have that face-to-face -face contact, nothing gets resolved. That's right. So the comment is the requirements for email documentations actually undermine uh, the culture of trust. Uh, so I wouldn't, and I didn't mention it, but the patient safety net was mentioned over and over again in our research. So it turns out the providers are using PSN as a place to uh, document uh, egregious interactions they had with another colleague. And PSN was not created for that purpose, as you know. So to a point that PSN is a verb, they say, I'm going to PSN you. <laughs> I got PSN. It became a term of threat rather than a vehicle of um, improving the quality. Uh, so I guess you'll have to be clear about why I'm using the email. When you, when you have unresolved conflict, I would not document it. Because I, what if I change my position? What if I was wrong? So let's go back to, uh, did anyone have other comments about this particular topic? If not, Dr. Chu, yes, Dr. Wen. Yes, well, I'm, I think the notion is email is great for facts or to document a decision that's already made, but it's not a place to resolve anything, it seems to me. And, and sometimes we want to document what's known uh, or just exchange something that's factual. The, part of what I wanted to ask you about, though, is the, the, the conflict of resource management mm -hmm. and time, and, and sort of essentially we're all getting pulled in so many different directions. Are there data about temporal trends over time in a in a perhaps more congenial, less frantic time period that perhaps is some romantic time that never existed. I don't know. But, <laughs> but I, I sort of feel like we're all multitasking all the time. And so that limited resource uh, makes it hard to bring resolution because we, we barely get together to talk about the things we want to do because we're always running around personally. I guess. Yeah. So the comment is about this, um, the hectic uh, pace and environment, and is there really truly time during the shift, 24-hour shift, where conflict is probably maybe muted, or uh, is there that romantic span? I don't know. Uh, that's an interesting, all we know is the night shift uh, teams tended to, um, they would accentuate, they would actually point to the shift time is a, a trigger of conflict because of the resource depletion. So I don't have an answer. So I, I just want to, did you have a comment? No. Uh, I just want to, did you have a comment? No. <laughs> OK. So these are insinuated comments. But Dr. Ju, why don't we end uh, with your question since it's uh, 4.30? Well, I think there's a question of balance between some conflict and no conflict. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just 
asking because I think you oh, also brought up an important point, right? Yes. You used the word create uh, constructive conflict yes. or creative conflict. Yes. yes. What do you think about that? Oh, uh, I, you know, I actually would not be a, a professional that I am in. I'm still works in the making without conflicts. It's, it's, I've had high stake conflict uh, with a, a high level leader here, and I had to learn to deal with it. I, I used this model, and uh, we both came to this place of mutual understanding to a point I sent a thank you note to that individual. If I don't have conflict in my professional repertoire, I will deem myself to be useless in this organization. <laughs> so thank you. I think conflict can be a, a portal into clarifying uh, our roles, expectations, it can actually, in my case, it has led me to be a better communicator and better person and better sort of monitor of my own motives and my intentions, especially what I say to characterize my colleagues in public. So on that note, I would like to thank you again and um, thank you for the invitation.